That felt like a playoff game at the Trop on Thursday night. And the team that came out victorious, the team that looked like it had been there and done that, was not the Rays and all their wins and all their playoff appearances, but it was the Orioles coming away with a huge extra innings victory to take over first place all alone in the AL East. I'll recap that, plus talk about the O's trade to acquire Shintaro Fujinabe, all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Friday, July 21st, 2023. And welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap a massive Orioles win at the Trop on Thursday night as the O's win it 4-3 to three in extra innings over the Rays to take over sole possession of first place in the AL East. I'll get you the five things you need to know from that victory, including Kyle Gibson just dealing, Ramon Arias making the play of the year, and Colton Kowser breaking out of his little slump to have his biggest swing at the major league level so far. Plus, we'll get into the Orioles' first trade of deadline season. They went a little early, making a trade on Wednesday for Shintaro Fujinami, the right-handed pitcher out of the A's bullpen who is coming to Baltimore and should start to bolster their pen this weekend. We'll talk about the scouting report on him, what he brings to the O's pen, where he'll fill in, and what the rest of that trade looked like for the Orioles. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms. We're also right here on YouTube. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube channel. We thank you so much to everyone who tunes in as these O's have catapulted into first place. Thank you to the everydayers out there. And this is kind of a cool episode for me, not just because the O's made a trade. The O's won a huge game. This is my 800th episode hosting Locked on Orioles. I know some of you out there have been there since day one. Thank you for all that. But even the everydayers who have come on in the later years, in the last couple of weeks, whatever it may be, if you're just tuning in for the first time, thank you so much for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. For your first listen today, we start with a gigantic Orioles victory at the Trop on Thursday night. Final score in 10 innings is the Orioles 4 and the Rays 3 as the two teams who were tied in terms of the win-loss column coming into the game, starting a four-game series, but the O's had a percentage point lead over Tampa, plus they had the tiebreaker. Well, now they are all alone atop the standings, taking a one-game lead in the American League East. For the first time all season, the Orioles are alone in first place in the AL East. In fact, it's the first time it hasn't been the Rays since that 13-0 start. They've just kind of cruised. Rays, not been playing great baseball lately. Last 64 games, 31-33. and The O's have certainly caught up. They get the win in game one of four. They get to 59-37 and on the season. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 4-3 to victory. And the first thing you need to know is, honestly, we got to go to the end of the game because Felix Bautista seems to just be from another dimension. I mean, what a job Bautista did in this game. He comes in in the bottom of the ninth inning of a 3-3 game and not only throws a scoreless ninth and then not only finishes out the win with a scoreless tenth with the zombie runner starting the inning at second, didn't even allow the guy to, to advance to third, let alone score. He does it in 15 pitches. It took him 15 pitches to get six outs in this game. Just an absurd performance from Bautista. And now here's a stat, right? Nine of his 15 pitches were fastballs. None of them were put in play. He got six swings on the fastball, five swings and misses, and one foul ball. The Rays were not even close. He averaged 100, touched 101 on Thursday night. He was in the zone with that four-seam fastball. It was ridiculous to watch. And just to see him come in, not only in the bottom of the ninth, but who he had to face, who he had to get to. Like, yeah, he got Christian Bethencourt to ground out to start the inning, but to strike out Yandy Diaz and Wander Franco, two of the best hitters in the AL East this season, and then to come back out there in the 10th. Remember, 
you know, the runner's on second. That's a tying run. He hits Luke Raley with the first pitch of the inning. You're thinking, this is going to get him all out of sorts. Randy Rosarena is coming up. He's killed the Orioles for his whole career. And then he just blows a fastball by a Rosarena, gets the double play. Adam Frazier, who's been terrible defensively, almost blew that double play, but Gunner's arm was strong enough to turn it on the turf, Brandon Lau, and the Orioles win it 4-3. to three. I mean, Felix is ridiculous. His ERA is down to .96 on the season. He's still allowed just one base runner since the All-Star game. He's too good. He is literally too good. Second thing you need to know from this one, let's rewind to the eighth inning. Actually, the last pitch that was thrown by an Orioles pitcher not named Felix Bautista. I think Ramon Arias made the defensive play of the year for the Orioles in the eighth inning of this game. Brian Baker was on in the eighth with two on and two out. Ground ball gets hit towards right field. It seems it's a 3-3 game. Looks like it's going to be an RBI single to give the Rays a 4-3 to lead. And then out of nowhere, on a hard-hit grounder off the bat of Harold Ramirez. I mean, it was 102 off the bat. 430 expected batting average. Here comes the gold glove of Ramon Arias at the position where he didn't even win the gold glove. Arias at second base on Thursday night. Diving play, gets up, just gets the throw in time to Santander at first base to end the inning, taking away a run. Just an outstanding play from Ramon Arias. Of course, Arias was huge with the bat, with the two doubles and the three RBIs in the win over the Dodgers on Wednesday. Now, he didn't do much with the bat in this game, went 0 for 3 with a strikeout but he was gigantic with that play. I think we're going to look back when we get to September and October, and we're going to remember that play from Ramon Arias for maybe flipping this entire AL East race. Third thing you need to know from the O's 4-3 extra inning win over the Rays is that, yeah, Colton Kowser is still slumping, but I think Thursday is going to start to help him break out of it just a little bit. Despite the average being at about 120, Kowser got the start in right field in this game, hitting eighth in the Oriole order. He's got to play pretty much every day with Cedric Mullins back on the injured list. And Kowser, well, you know, he started over two, but then he gets it going. In the seventh, crushes a ground ball single, 104 off the bat. And then the big AB happened in the 10th. After Adam Frazier got down a sack bunt to start the 10th, getting Aaron Hicks to third with one out. Hicks was the zombie runner. Colton Kowser delivers with two strikes, lines one into left field for a sack fly, got the run home any way he could, gave the Orioles the four to three lead, gives them the win eventually after Felix closes it out. And listen, I get that Kowser is still hitting 133 and still has just a 458 OPS, but the swings looked a lot better on Thursday night. And that was by far the biggest spot he has been in, in his major league career so far. All that pressure on the road, first place on the line, and he delivers in extra innings. You know this guy is ready. The stats are going to come up. It's just going to take a little bit of time, like it did for Gunner this year, like it did for Adley last year. It's going to take some time, but that was that was clutch, and that was awesome to see from Colton Kowser on Thursday night. Fourth thing you need to know from this one is that I'm going to be completely honest with you. The Orioles, and not the Rays in this game, looked like the team – that had been there before. I mean, you think about what this AL East race is going to be over the last couple of months. You've got two good teams in the Rays and the Orioles. And yeah, I mean, honestly, you could say you have five good teams in the AL East with, you know, the Yankees are kind of sputtering, but they're going to get Aaron Judge back and the Red Sox are playing a little better and the Blue Jays still have a good roster. But you're looking at these two teams, it seems like a two-horse race for now. And I think most people would think because of the Rays' hot start and because the Rays have done it before, right? They've won back-to-back division titles. They went to the World Series in 2020. They continue to go to the postseason, churn through players, and it's just a great system they've got over there. And the O's, well, it's been a whole lot of losing. You know, I mean, just barely finished over 500 last year after four just horrendous seasons. And now they're finally in this spot again for the first time in a long time. I mean, none of these players on the O's have been in this spot with Baltimore. So you would think when push comes to shove in these huge games, maybe the O's would be the team that starts to make mistakes where the Rays look like the team that's been there, done that, the pressure doesn't get to us. But I'm going to be honest with you. The Orioles played a pretty clean game in this one, whereas the Rays certainly did not. And to be honest with you, the reason why the O's, I feel like, won this game was that three-run fourth inning that they got. And yes, it did come against Tyler Glass now. Now, only two of the three runs were earned, and and he was pretty good in this start. Went seven innings, struck out nine with no walks. But the Rays' defense just, 
completely let them down in that fourth inning. It's not something you would expect from this Tampa Bay team, but Gunnar Henderson hits that ball out the left field to start the inning. Now, it was initially called a double and an error. Henderson has since been given a triple, but Randy Rosarena just kind of fell asleep in left field, just lobs the throw in, kind of taking his time, and Gunnar smartly takes off for third and gets the extra base. Then they bring the infield in. Adley Rutschman gets just enough of one to get it over Brandon Lau's head for an RBI single. Then you got the Santander single. The Ryan O'Hearn sack fly makes it two to one. And then on the Aaron Hicks single, when Santander should have been out by a mile at home plate, a Rosa Miranda made a good throw. Francisco Mejia just caught the ball and then simply dropped the ball. I mean, that should have been an out of the plate. He loses the ball. Santander is safe, makes it three to one. It's just mistakes that you don't really see the Rays making, or at least you see these two teams and where they've been the last few years, you expect the O's to be the ones to make the mistakes. And that's not what happened. It was the O's that capitalized on the Rays' mistakes in the fourth inning, and that was their big frame that helped them to win this game. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 4-3 to win in this one, he didn't factor into the decision, but we have to shout out Kyle Gibson. He was phenomenal in this start for the Orioles. Now, He still got a quality start. His line should look better. But the final line was six-plus innings, three runs on seven hits. He struck out eight, walked two, no homers, 91 pitches, and seven hard-hit balls against him by the Rays in six innings. Now, there was some questioning about why Gibson was allowed to go back out there in the seventh inning. He was only at about 80 pitches. He had just gotten an eight-pitch, one, two, three, sixth inning, and he was cruising along. I mean, it was the right thing to do, especially when you consider – it was 8-9-1 coming up in the order. So he's going to start by facing the bottom half of the order. He did allow a hard hit single to start the inning from Taylor Walls. But then, I mean, Christian Bethencourt gets the bunt single down. That's unfortunate for the Orioles there. And they go to Yenye Cano, and Cano just didn't look quite like himself. And Diaz hits the two-run double. And luckily, Cano gets Rayleigh to line into that double play to get out of the jam, even though that ball was hit 109 off the bat. So Cano wasn't great, and he could have done better and kept the O's in the lead. But I thought Gibson was fantastic, and he's really struggled lately. So for him to come into the biggest game of the year for the Orioles and pitch six-plus innings, pitch into the seventh, pitch that well, and have 19 whiffs, Kyle Gibson hasn't really been a strikeout pitcher the last couple of years, but he had 19 whiffs on 47 swings. That's one of the best numbers for any Orioles pitcher this year, and he mixed all his pitches. He threw 20 sweepers, which was his most used pitch, seven whiffs on 10 swings on the sweeper, Six whiffs on 12 swings on the curveball. Four whiffs on eight swings on the changeup. He was just devastating Ray's hitters with the breaking stuff. It was awesome to see that is the Kyle Gibson that the Orioles need down the stretch this season. Whether or not they add another starting pitcher, and I think they should, they're going to continue to rely on Gibson because he eats innings. He's a veteran guy who's been in the postseason before. Nobody else on this O's staff has. They're going to rely on him in these spots. If he gives them starts like this, the O's are going to be in a much, much better spot. But with the help of Gibson, the help of the offense, the help of the defense, the Orioles win it 4-3 to three in extra innings over the Rays, and they are now one game up on Tampa in the American League East. And not just that, but the O's have started to add to the roster as well. Some reinforcements should be joining the O's this weekend as they make their first trade of deadline season. O's kind of really kicking it off for the other teams here as they acquire the right-handed pitcher Shintaro Fujinami from the Oakland A's to help bolster the bullpen. So coming up next, I'll give you the scouting report on the 29-year-old righty, what he can do for the Orioles, what he's done with the Oakland Athletics, and what role he could have in this bullpen. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by eBay Motors. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. And it's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit or your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. So get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. 
So the Orioles take down the Rays 4-3 to three in 10 innings in a huge win in the biggest game of the year for the O's, and they are now one game up on Tampa in the American League East. But they were once again, I would say the one negative from Thursday night's game is a couple of cracks in the bullpen again, right? I mean, Yenye Cano comes in. He gives up the two-run double. He's lucky to get out of the jam. He did. Brian Baker comes in in the eighth. He allows two runs, or two not two runs. That would have been bad. Two base runners, though. And Ramon Arias had to save him with the play of the year to avoid the Rays taking the lead. And yes, Felix Bautista was untouchable, but it's still becoming tougher and tougher to get to Bautista. And honestly, Cano's still good. I still trust him, but he is regressing to the mean a little bit. I mean, there's there's no other way to put it. He is not the pitcher we saw the first six weeks of the season. What does that mean? Well, the O's need relievers. And what did they do on Wednesday? They made their first trade for a reliever. That reliever is an interesting one. It's the right-handed pitcher, Shintaro Fujinami, 29-year-old that they acquired from the Oakland Athletics, Orioles sending left-handed pitching prospect Easton Lucas over to the A's in the deal. Now, second deal the O's have made with the A's in the last calendar years. Of course, they acquired Cole Irvin and another minor league pitcher for Daryl Hernandez this offseason. Of course, Irvin's been up and down and you know, currently pitching fairly well out of the Orioles' bullpen, but they go back to the well. And we know the O's needed a reliever. This is their first one. So let's start with who is Fujinami and what has his season been like for the A's? Well, first of all, 29-year-old, six foot six right-handed pitcher who is pitching his first season in Major League Baseball, coming over from Japan where he pitched in the MPB, the top league in Japan, and widely regarded as the second best professional league in the world. Fujinami signed a one-year $3.25 million contract with the Oakland Athletics this offseason. Now, the Orioles will pay him $1.3 million for the rest of this year. So, obviously, basically prorated, it's less than half of the deal. Now, he is a rental, right? It's just a one-year deal he signed, so he will be a free agent after the season. Now, nothing's stopping the O's from re-signing him if they really like what he does out of the bullpen. But for now, he is a rental reliever. Now, he's been pitching in Japan for a long time, despite a short track record in Major League Baseball. He started his pro career in the NPB in Japan since 2013 when he was a 19-year-old phenom prospect. He was talked about in the same sentences as Shohei Otani when he first started pitching professionally in Japan. 2013, he was the first overall draft pick that year at 19 years old. And he kind of had an up and down NPB career, kind of literally. He had multiple stints in the minor leagues because of command issues. But he was kind of half and half a reliever and a starter. He made 87 starts and made 102 relief appearances in his MPB career. And in right about 1,000 career innings over there, he had a 3.41 ERA, about nine strikeouts per nine, but four walks per nine was always his issue. Now, the stuff has not been an issue, and it certainly wasn't an issue in Japan, and it hasn't been an issue here. Let's start with the fastball. 56% of the time he throws this pitch. He loves to go to it because it's tough to hit. It is a fastball that has averaged 98 this year, but since the A's moved him to the bullpen, and we'll get to kind of how they moved him around, he's been more like 99 to 100, topping out at 102 with the four-seam fastball. Now, it's very similar in velocity to Felix Bautista. It doesn't have that kind of almost upward movement that Bautista's does. It doesn't have as much efficient spin as Bautista's, but it's still a good fastball. It's got a 26% whiff rate. Opponents hit 264 against it. Then the reason why I mentioned Bautista, his number two pitch is the splitter. Throws it about 20% of the time. And here's where he differs a little bit from Bautista. Felix sits around 90 with that splitter. Fujinabi's been known to be 92 to 95 with the splitter. It's almost similar to the Juan Duran splinker where he throws it almost 100 miles an hour. But that splitter is really good. Hitters only hit 227 against it. Average launch angle against that pitch is negative two degrees, which means everybody just beats it into the ground. And oh yeah, it's got a 38% whiff rate as well. He also has a cutter 16% of the time. This has been at times his best pitch. 182 batting average against is the lowest of any pitch he throws. 42% whiff rate is the highest of any pitch he throws. He's really a three pitch guy. Now, He's been known to throw a sweeper and a slider at times, and he's tossed in a couple of sinkers and curveballs this year. But generally, you can think of him as a fastball splitter cutter guy. And when you think about the stuff, Eno Saris of The Athletic tweeted this out on Thursday. Eno has this stuff plus rating and this location plus rating. 
Stuff Plus basically looks at a pitcher's stuff. It doesn't care about how you locate, your control, your command, how effective you are. It's just purely stuff. Fujinami sits barely below Felix Bautista in the Stuff Plus rating. He also has a stat called Location Plus. Basically, just tries to show how good is your pitch location compared to the rest of the league. Fujinami is dead even with Felix Bautista. The thought of the Orioles here on making this move is, if we can get that command under control, we might have Felix Bautista 2.0. Because remember, Bautista in the minors for 10 years couldn't get the command going. Fujinami in Japan for 10 years couldn't get the command going. Maybe the O's can do the same thing here. That is why it is so enticing. Now, we got to go to the flip side, which is what he's done with the A's this year. And if you look at the stats overall, you maybe don't love this move, right? If you take a first look. With the A's this season, Fujinami came over. The A's wanted to use him as a starter early. It didn't go well, and they eventually put him into the bullpen. He's made 34 appearances, seven starts, and in 49 in the third innings with the Oakland A's this year, Fujinami has an 8.57 ERA. That is not good. Now, it's a 4.94 FIP, which usually does a better job of kind of predicting how a pitcher will perform. So he's been very, very unlucky this year. 22% strikeout rate is about league average. 13% walk rate is well above league average. But when you split it up into different parts of the season, you can see why the O's made this move and how he's getting better as the season goes on. As a starting pitcher, before they moved into the pen, 17 and two-thirds innings, he had a 14.26 ERA, 15% walk rate, 13% or 15% K rate, 13% walk rate. He was the worst starter in baseball, basically, when he had him in the rotation, and it wasn't even close. As a reliever, 31 and two-thirds innings, almost double the sample size. 5.40 ERA, still not great, but much better. 27% strikeout rate. The Ks almost doubled, whereas the walks have stayed about the same at 13%. Now, he has gone multiple innings at times out of the bullpen, but he's been struggling more with that. So I would look at him more as a one-inning guy at this point. Now, this is going to be a very arbitrary date. But since May 27th, Fujinami turned it around. And you got to give the guy some time. I mean, two months to kind of adjust to a brand new league, a brand new level, a brand new country, a brand new city he's living in, a brand new way of life coming over, you know, lived in Japan his entire life. And at 29, he comes to the US. That's some off the field things you got to think about. But it seemed like around the end of May, he settled in because he was moved to the bullpen. And since May 27th, here are Fujinami's stats. 21 and two thirds innings out of the pen, a 3.32 ERA, 26% strikeout rate above league average and a 7% walk rate is well below the league average as well. He has kind of put things together. Since then, his splitter usage has gone up. His chase rate has gone way up and his hard hit percentage has gone way down. So it's not just a fluke that he's getting better. I think he's pitching more like the pitcher he should be and was just in a bad role, was uncomfortable and was unlucky early in the season. And in July specifically, he's been awesome. Eight innings pitched in July for the A's before the trade, two runs, four hits, 10 strikeouts, and no walks in his eight July innings. That was after he was basically walking everybody as a starter in April and May. That is a great trend in the right direction for Fujinami. And that's why, despite looking at those numbers and being like, what are the O's doing here? When you dig a little deeper, you can see why they like this guy, and you can see why they think he might get even better as the season goes on. So the question becomes, okay, what's his role in Birdland? Because the O's have Bautista, and despite some small struggles recently, they've got Cano. But where does he fit in other than that? We'll talk about that coming up, and we'll also talk about the other parts of this trade with Easton Lucas being sent over to the A's and the O's having to clear a spot on the 40-man roster as well. So the Orioles made their first trade of deadline season. Shintaro Fujinami bringing him over from the A's. Now, Brandon Hyde talked to the media before Thursday's game. The trade was made on Wednesday. Hyde said that Fujinami has not joined the team yet. He's hoping they'll get him sometime this weekend. So it's no guarantee Fujinami is even with the O's tonight for Friday's game. But I would think probably by Saturday's game, he will be activated 
for the Orioles. And, and these are big games, right? They take game one from the Rays, four to three in extras, but still three more games in this four game set that are going to be ginormous for the Orioles. Because even if you just get two out of four, even if you just split the series, you finish in first place. If you can get three out of four from this team and go two games up, that would be huge for the O's. But they've got three more games this weekend, starting tonight at 640. Kyle Bradish, who has been dynamite for the O's, takes the mound. He'll go up against Zach Eflin, who the righty has a 3.59 ERA, kind of changed his career around since signing with the Rays this offseason. That'll be a good pitching matchup. Saturday is a 4-10 game. This one's going to be fun. Grayson Rodriguez, his second start back on the hill with the O's, takes on Shane McClanahan, who's been just as good this year and is in line to potentially win a Cy Young this season with a 2.56 ERA on the year. And finally, Sunday will close it out. Tyler Wells looking to bounce back from what was by far his worst start of the season on Tuesday against the Dodgers. He'll go against Taj Bradley, the rookie right-hander who has electric, incredible stuff, but hasn't always put it together because he does have a 5.29 ERA on the year. That's what the weekend looks like against the Rays. And you can listen to every pitch of the Orioles hometown radio broadcast of the final three games of this weekend series between the Orioles and the Rays, the battle for first place in the AL East. You can listen to every pitch with the SXM app through Sirius XM. Just download the app and search Orioles. And hopefully you could get to listen to Shintaro Fujinami's first outing in an Oriole uniform. And that's the question here. After the O's have acquired him, what is his role with the O's? I don't think he's taken over the eighth inning. I think that's still Cano's for now. I think he's going to be in a somewhat high leverage spot, kind of trading off with Brian Baker and Danny Coulomb in terms of who gets the game to Cano and Bautista. Now we could see if Cano continues to struggle, him kind of get less and less high leverage spots. And Fujinami is a guy who could fill in there. Now Coulomb's been good. Baker's been up and down, but he's got really good stuff. Fujinami is just another guy to throw in there in the sixth, seventh, or eighth innings who's pitched in a lot of key moments for the A's because he's been their go-to reliever at times this year. Their bullpen is an absolute disaster, as is their entire team, organization, front office, et cetera, et cetera. But I think he could be more of a back-end guy, especially because how well he's been pitching lately. You know, maybe you have a spot where if Bautista stays in the ninth, Cano stays in the eighth. If it's heavier on lefties, maybe you go to Danny Coulomb. If it's heavier on righties in the seventh, maybe you go with Fujinami. You have Baker there where, yeah, he's not you know the lockdown guy he was at times last year, but he actually gets lefties out at a better rate than righties, so you can have him go through the lineup longer. Coulomb can get lefties and righties out. Fujinami, you know, I'd rather have him face righties, but there's not a gigantic split for him against both sides. Just rather have him face right-handers. But I do think, you know, it's not going to be like, oh, he's, you know, the seventh or eighth man in the bullpen. Like, they're going to go to him in some key spots because, as we know, they need middle relief help and even late relief help right now. Fujinami is going to be thrown into the fire a little bit. Now he's pitched a lot of high leverage for the A's. He'll be ready for it. He's been pitching better of, of late. And, you know, I think the O's can trust him. And even if it doesn't work out super well, like I don't think there's a situation where they'd get rid of him immediately. Like I don't think he's going to be as bad as he was early in the year. There's still a question about whether he has minor league options. Fangraph says he does, but people have said because he came over as an international free agent, there might be weird stuff where he can refuse an assignment to AAA Norfolk. Either way, even if it doesn't work out perfectly, the O's did this trade two weeks before the deadline, which means if he's not like an eighth inning guy, if he turns out to be more of a sixth inning guy, you still have time to evaluate that and go make another trade before the August 1st deadline, right? You still have at this point, what, 11 days to go make another deal to get another reliever. I think they could still use another reliever, but especially if he's not going to be completely locked down, you can get another guy, and that is huge for the O's to do this trade earlier. And even before that, you're going to get him for like 10 more days than you would have gotten if you waited until the deadline exactly, and especially with this huge raise series right here. I mean, more games, the better to have this guy make your bullpen better. Now, other than that, we wanted to quickly look before we go at what the rest of this deal was. Because as I mentioned earlier, it was a one-for-one -one swap, pitcher for pitcher, as the Orioles sent left-handed pitcher Easton Lucas over to the A's in this deal. Now, Easton Lucas is a 26-year-old left-handed reliever who will turn 27 in September, actually not that much younger than Fujinami is. Jonathan VR, 
that's who the O's sent away to get Easton Lucas. When they traded VR after the 2019 season, sent him to the Marlins, Easton Lucas was the pitcher who came back. Now, one of the reasons why they traded Lucas is he's Rule 5 eligible this offseason. Now, he was Rule 5 eligible last offseason, but he was only in Double A and not for that much time. And even though the stuff was ticking up, I don't think the O's felt they needed to protect him. His stuff's been pretty good this year. He would have been a guy that the O's would have considered protecting, but I don't think they would have had room for him on the 40-man roster. And so they may have lost him for nothing. So it was pretty smart by the O's and Michael Elias to make the trade now. That's what you're going to see from the O's moving forward is the first prospects they're going to try to trade are the guys who are 40-man eligible or, or Rule 5 eligible in the offseason need to be put on the 40-man, but they already know that they may not have space for him. That's something the Rays do a really great job of, and that is kind of what the O's did here. Now, this season, Easton Lucas started in Double A. He ticked up his fastball to like 96, 97 from the left side, and he was dominant in Double A. 17 innings, 39% K rate, and a 6% walk rate. He was ridiculous. So he goes up to AAA, hasn't had the same success in AAA Norfolk. 13 and two-thirds innings, 4.61 ERA, 23% strikeouts, but a 15% walk rate is ridiculous. Like, that's worse than Fujinami was having early in the year. Now, with the A's being so bad and their bullpen being a mess, Easton Lucas will probably get a chance to go to the bigs this year. Heck, they might have Daryl Hernandez in the bigs this year at this point. He's up in AAA now. Happy for both of them. Hopefully they can get to the bigs with Oakland and uh, get a shot on a big league team where I don't think the O's would have had room for either Hernandez or Lucas to make an impact in MLB with the Orioles. Now, Easton Lucas was not on the 40-man roster. O's had a full 40-man, so they had to make a 40-man move to get Fujinami on there, and that move was DFAing Josh Lester. Now, Lester, the left-handed hitter, kind of corner infielder, corner outfielder, who saw a little bit of time with the O's this year, signed him to a minor league contract in the offseason after he had basically stalled out in AAA with the Tigers and been released. 23 plate appearances. We didn't see a lot of him. Four for 22, seven Ks, one walk for the Orioles. Had that one big hit in San Francisco, but that was about it. It was cool to see him get his first big league hit with the Orioles, though. He was red hot in AAA to start the year, and that's why the O's called him up. But he has really cooled off in Norfolk since the O's sent him back down. And on the season, he does have 15 homers. He's been one of the Tide's best power hitters. But he actually has just a 96 WRC+. plus in AAA. That was after killing it in the first two months, and he's now 4% worse than a league average AAA hitter. With Heston Kerstad up in AAA now, with Kobe Mayo up in AAA now, it's been pretty hard to get Lester at bats anyway. Now there's a chance he does clear waivers, and the Orioles get to keep him in the org and keep him in Norfolk, but I didn't really see him at any point being a call-up, because if the O's needed another corner guy, left-handed bat, they were going to go to Kerstad, I think pretty easily before they went to Lester at this point. So it was the right move to DFA him because I don't think they would need him any longer in the season. And then the last question would be, you know, who gets optioned when Fujinami comes up? I think it's pretty obvious it'll be Logan Gillespie, who was added to the bullpen two days ago, hasn't pitched yet to this point. He would be the easy guy to send down, and the bullpen gets better, gets stronger with Fujinami joining it. So what a week for the O's. First place in the East, they make an early trade to make the bullpen better. And they go into a huge weekend, and hopefully on Monday, they've got a first place spot and maybe a little bit bigger lead in the AL East. But I'll be back with you on Monday, recapping the final three game of this series between the Orioles and the Rays. It's going to be fun. Buckle up. There's going to be some awesome playoff atmosphere, just tense but incredibly exciting Orioles baseball coming up over the next few days. And I'll be back to recap it with you here on the pod on Monday. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, your first place team, every day.